and by America. It's time for real television as MMM Carpets brings you movies till the sun comes up. Thing. Welcome to Movies Till Dawn a new podcast that's a safe space for filmmakers to talk about the fascinating and exasperating and always unusual and never quite the same thing twice process of creating motion pictures. I'm Raymond DeFelita, and I'm the show's Toastmaster General. Okay, so here's part two of my conversation with Mary Harron that I had in the summer of 2019. And we kind of go off the rails a little here and talk about all kinds of strange stuff. We talk about rehearsing. Okay, that's not that strange. We talk about shooting sex scenes, which in and of itself is a strange thing to do. Uh, Then we also talk about Mary's six degrees of separation with a really odd collection of Hollywood types and and movies that she's connected to, including Stanley Kubrick. Uh, Also, her stepmother, Virginia Leaf, who's the, uh, the star of a cult favorite called The Brain That Wouldn't Die. How Mary is connected with the uh, old country music kind of comedy show, Hee Haw. Uh, She talks about her childhood uh, spending summers in L.A., which she feels, and I think she's right, probably led to her interest in the underbelly of showbiz. Um, And she talks about her start as a music journalist, too. Uh, The movie we discuss is I Shot Andy Warhol, her first feature. And, um, you know, we talk a good deal about Valerie Solanas, who's the central figure uh, in that movie, and as part of that discussion, we discuss Valerie Solanus' play, which is called Up Your Ass. And uh, aside from that, <clears throat> you'll, you'll have to just listen for yourself. And, and uh, we also talk a little bit about our mutual bittersweet feelings about the new distribution models of indie films. And here's part two of my conversation with Mary Harron. <laughs> Just on a on a technical level, because every every director does this differently. Do you, do you like to rehearse before you even begin the shoot? And and the reason I ask that with a certain amount of pain is, I don't, and I always feel like I'm somehow cheating somebody out of something by not. My my feeling always is I I, I like to show the actors the, the the sets we're working in. I like them to see the environment. What I've usually found is they start just kind of spontaneously acting once they're there. But to have a formal rehearsal always feels awkward to me, and I just wonder how you, how you and I'm, I'm not entirely alone, but it, it's interesting to me how each director has their own sense of that. Yeah, I mean, I usually have a few days of rehearsal. I don't, I don't have extensive, extensive rehearsals like some people do. Some people like rehearse for weeks and weeks. I usually can't afford that, but also I don't feel the need, but I do find there's some very interesting things that happen in rehearsal. Um, but the real, there's, there's a couple things I do. One is I've learned that when I have a main actor or a couple main actors and are already carrying something, um, I sit with them and I go through the script scene by scene and just talk it through with them. And I, I've always done that. Yeah, absolutely. And to me, that's really the, almost the most important thing I do. Then I enjoy having some rehearsal time and I just see how the scenes play and maybe I make some changes. Uh, for instance, in American Psycho, we were rehearsing. I wanted to, and I do try and rehearse sex scenes because they're very difficult to shoot, um, and you you want to kind of do them a bit like athletics, you know, you or choreography. You want to kind of have the moves down so that you can. I don't like to shoot a lot of takes of a sex scene, so it's like okay, let's work out exactly what our moves are, and then we'll we'll do it, you know, in a sort of brisk. In professional way, that's my, my method for that. Same thing with violence, you know, but uh, violence, it's a little harder to rehearse if you have special effects and stuff. But with sex scenes, um, we had the, um, uh, the three-way sex scene in American Psycho, which is Bateman um, with t- uh, two prostitutes. And uh, it's like, okay, we're going we're gonna to work out these moves and everything. And we were rehearsing in a, in a room where they had a bed and they had a, a wardrobe with a mirror. And when I saw the mirror, it's like, oh, that really transformed the scene for me. So they were sort of on top. We said, okay, you're on top there and Christian's there and Carrie, you're there. And um, 
he started sort of, I said, look, at, look in the mirror. Do the whole thing. You have this whole sex scene, but look at yourself in the mirror. And he really ran with that. And of course, in the scene, he's just like, like at one point, he's flexing his muscles and stuff when we actually shot it, which is very hilarious. So I mean, I guess that I could have had that experience on set as well, but it was allowed me a way to kind of strategize. Sure, the sure. Scene. But it's interesting because then to you know, just to go back briefly um, to, to Charlie says, you have scenes in there that I think of as happenings. Uh, for instance, the. Um, the violence at the dinner table after the he smashes the guitars up after the failed audition mm. performance. Mm. That violence, which is so difficult to watch, and it ends in something even worse, which is him subjugating her by making out with her and trying to show the group that this is a form of love from Manson. I, ha I have to assume it was painful to shoot, but it's also shot, as I say, like a happening. It's caught. Well, I had a great, you know, the, yes, I mean, and, and in this case, the DP, Krilla Fosberg, who's Swedish, who's great DP, too. I've been very lucky with my DPs. Um, he's uh, done a lot of famous music videos. And he said to me, uh, when we were talking about it, I said, you know, we're going to shoot very fast. This, this, uh, Charlie Says was shot in 20 days. Uh, a lot of it will be handheld. Uh, and I want, and, and Matt Smith in particular has asked me if he can improvise. Um, and I've said yes because I felt that that's right for the character. And he said, well, when I do music videos, you know, I'm, I'm with an artist who may have spent a year on a song and developing an act. And he says, and, and I think it's my job to follow them wherever they go. Um, and so he, his hand, he was very, very good at capturing the action. We didn't rehearse that one a, a lot. We obviously did rehearse it on set uh, a couple times, uh, several times. Oh, and I think we, oh, and we did rehearse the fight between um, um, Charlie and, and Susan Atkins because I needed a, um, I had a stunt person there with me. That kind of thing I always rehearse. Sure. So we needed to, 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 to go through all the holds and, and what was gonna happen and, and you know, minimize any danger. Um, but then when we got on set, you know, again, it's like bang, something else happens and it takes off and it's very unpredictable. And so um, Krilla had to be right there. You know, and we only, I can't remember, maybe three or four takes, but a lot of it is one, is to all one shot. Yeah. Well, the, well the, the, the birth scene, too. Yeah. Another happening, if you will. <laughs> I, I had, yeah. You know, it, it's... Uh, um, Suki, is it staged? Is it how much or is it caught? Do you kind of just, you oh. know, see, this is what we're going to do and let's shoot. Let's just get into it. I mean, you know, we rehearsed it and then we shot it and then we did a few times. I never do a lot of takes. I mean, you, I mean, that's not always true, but usually I try not to do more than four takes, not in the kind of budgets I have. It's very funny. Suki Waterhouse, who plays Mary, who's giving birth, did the birth scene in her audition. Oh, and really? And it was really, really impressive. It's like, wow. By her choice? By her choice. I said, do you want to do the birth scene? She said, yes. And she totally totally was in the audition room like screaming and I was like wow that was so impressive so yeah. yes <laughs> so I knew that she could get there you know you have a you have an interesting uh, kind of six degrees actually more like two degrees from some strange people in your family one of whom is well I'd say the six degrees would be Stanley Kubrick yes your stepmother acted in yes. Fear and Desire, which mm -hmm. not only is it important because it's Kubrick's first film, but it's a very raw, early, one-person show, mm -hmm. uh, uh, independent film. It's funny because my, step yeah, my stepmother was a starlet in the 1950s. She'd been a model. Virginia Leith. Virginia Leith. And I called her, you know, she and my father were divorced, like, you know, uh, 50 years ago or something, but uh, I called her up because I was still in touch with her and said, well, I'm doing this film about Betty Page. I want to talk to you about being a sex symbol in the 1950s. And she sort of laughed and said, yeah. And she said, you know, when you were a girl in the 50s, you had large breasts. It was right after the war. And you had large breasts. And you looked a certain way. So people would give you anything, you know, just for a few years, you know, just all doors would open, you know, Nobel Prize winners would want to talk to, you know, sit next to you at dinner. <laughs> it was funny. She, she had this whole thing about what beauty did for and I think she also experienced the, um, my stepmother certainly experienced the dark side of Hollywood too as a, as a young starlet, as, as you all would have. But she'd been a model and Stanley Kubrick went through a, a sheaf of photographs and, and chose her off a photograph. And he was this young, you know, sort of hotshot photographer. He was always worried that she was, she was wearing makeup. He said she would come up to her and kind of rub her eyes to make sure she wasn't wearing mascara. Um, 
and I think she, I think she could see it was very, you know, good visually. But I don't think, I don't think he talked to her much. I don't think it was a, he was a big actor's director at that point. It was all about the, the visuals. Um, and then she went out. She had an interesting career. She did a couple big movies. She was under contract to Fox for seven years, and she did A Kiss Before Dying. Uh, with Joanne Woodward and all that, and and then after seven years, her career kind of was uh, Fox dropped her after seven years, and her last film was this B movie called The Brain That Wouldn't Die. Her brain kept alive by experimental science, by a man whose abnormal passions inspired him to try the impossible. I brought her back. She'll live, and I'll get her another body. Yes. And what of her soul? How can you make of her an experiment of horror? His mad ambitions and desires threaten every woman possessing an attractive body. Girls whose measurements make them beauty contest participants. Professional figure models such as this. All are prey to his distorted desires. Which uh, she played the brain. You know, she played the head that's being kept in a tray. It's one of those... Um, and it's a 1950s auteur B horror movie or C horror movie. And in some ways, it's a really fascinating movie. And I watched it. It's like, oh, this really is auteur. This is like out there. This is very interesting. And funnily enough, it's now her, by far her most famous film. When I was a kid, I was brought up, that, oh, there's this big joke that she, she made this film, and they shot it in three days, and they gave her like $500, and she had to sit there for, for three days, like with her head in this sort of tray of bubbling liquid, you know. Uh, but that was like the end of her career. So I grew, I grew up, it was very interesting being a, quite a, affected by my stepmother's story and then we, you know, going out there spending summers in, in Los Angeles. And the idea is what I said before about the, the underside of, of fame and, you know, sort of <laughs> kind of like, you know, t shattered dreams or whatever, you know, like you're, you're well, famous just, and then you're not. Yeah, you know? and I'm just thinking as, as we're talking about it, so th this could be, her story could be one of your films. Yes, absolutely. Virginia's story could be, you know, with a, a bad childhood and all could, could be one of one of my films and I, so I, yeah so I think it I think I was quite immersed and when um, I remember spending a summer in California and we were uh, staying in my stepmother's house uh, that she, uh, she bought for her mother when she was under contract to Fox so she bought this little house and there was this feeling of kind of yeah the 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 it kind of failed Hollywood, what can I say? Mm -hmm. And then we were staying the other part of the summer with friends who were much more successful out in Malibu. And so I was just always very aware. My dad was an actor, he'd been a very successful Broadway actor, but then he was out in Hollywood. And Hollywood never went well for my dad. He made a couple movies, but it, you know, he was under contract to Paramount. And then he was doing a lot of TV, but didn't become a star in the end. And then in, in movies, and then went and ended up Going to back to Canada, doing doing very well. In well, you're, but other aren't you things. skipping a big part of his? his oh, well, that, no, skipping that, hee -haw. Oh no, that was before hee haw. Okay. Then he went back to Canada. Because that's another one of the most interesting part of your six degrees of your, oh, your my, hee haw, my, Stanley Kubrick, Virginia Leaf. It, it's yeah, so interesting. Yeah, yeah, my family story is crazy. And then my dad, um, who'd been always worked. I mean, I, I'm not one of those actor kids who like ever worried about the next meal. My dad always worked. He also wrote, and he wrote Canada's most successful musical, Anne of Green Gables. Anyway, he, he went back to Canada when they were reviving that and then decided to stay. And he had a comic character he used to do, was a Canadian farmer called Charlie Farquharson. And he'd always done that in like comic review, which he'd always done. He'd always done comedy as well, comic review and sketch comedy. And um, he started doing the reviews based on that and then sort of comic review. And then some Canadians decided that they would do the country music version of Laugh-In called Hee Haw and that my dad was going to go down to Nashville a few weeks a year and appear in the in this and he said at the time he said oh, okay you're gonna wear you're gonna have to I was I was living I I moved to England when I was 13 with my mother and stepfather and my sister and he said um, okay you're gonna have to wear a um, wear a bag over your head when you go to school because I'm doing hee-haw and, and you'll be embarrassed by it. And at that point, it was like, oh, God, country music, so uncool. And um, I actually, it, in later years, grew to absolutely love country music. And I realized later that all the stuff that I'd made fun of and laughed at and these covers of these albums, like, you know, um, it just seemed so, Kitty Wells or whatever, it seemed so corny to me. And then I realized, actually, oh, my God, this 
you know, Tammy Wynette became my, my, my favorite, one of my greatest experiences is seeing Tammy Wynette in concert. And then I, I started writing about, I used to write about, I started off writing about punk music and, and when I was writing about music, but then I became, nobody else wanted to do country music when I was writing for Melody Maker in London. So I would go uh, to the, um, like the disc jockeys convention in Nashville or the, the country music uh, weeks and you'd get to see all the great country stars of the, you know, this was in the, um, the early 80s. And I actually, because I, I, cause of my dad, I got to like hang out with Jerry Lee Lewis and stuff because, of, you know, backstage at a club in Memphis and stuff. So I, I managed to meet, you know, some of the famous country music people. But I absolutely love that music and, and Hee Haw Now, which is a corny show, but it actually has some great comedy performers in it. Um, I would say that it was a kind of a guilty pleasure it's a, show. Yeah, it's a guilty pleasure because for me and my mom especially, we, yes. we we would watch it in secret. My father was like, you know, hee haw, what are you doing? Hee haw is back, and it's all brand new. New faces, new features, new fun, and new hits by country's greatest stars: Loretta Lynn, George Jones, Barbara Mandrell, Charlie Pride, Alabama, on the all new hee haw. Sunday afternoon at 4 on TV 21. But some of it's really funny. Junior Semple and all those guys are very yeah. funny. And, um, and then the, um, the music's fantastic. And it took me... I learned a lot about taste. It's like after that when I realized that I really loved country music. I learned a lot from... Uh, there's a great critic called Lester Bangs who, who died young, mm -hmm. who was a friend of mine in, in the New York punk scene. And I learned from Lester that you shouldn't have categories. And if something's good, it's good. You know, and, and actually, if you go to the sort of heart of something, and, and then if you like it, you could make it cool just by saying you like it, you know, and I was not going to be embarrassed about liking country music, and I could just embrace it. Yeah. So, yeah, so I kind of came full circle on the whole hee-haw thing. Last night I was at Max's Kansas City. That's the chic hangout for the jet set of the world. They called it the factory. <laughs> Roger Bedeen was there with Jane Fonda. Andy Warhol was there too. A place to create art. I'm writing a play and I want him to produce it. Well, Andy just makes movies now. Be discovered. I did my Kim Novak film and he was very impressed. And make a scene. Oh, God, I hate morning. It is morning, isn't it? It starts to make it seem inevitable that you would wind up making your debut feature, I Shot Andy Warhol. Because you're dealing with showbiz frustration, yeah. you're dealing with a, a piece of popular culture that's largely misunderstood, at least from this perspective, yeah. and probably at its own time. That was supposed to be a documentary, though, originally, right? I mean, originally, well, I was working in documentary, but I had already, when I had the idea for I Shot Andy Warhol, I was, I had not started to direct, it. I, I spent like five years working as a researcher in British television. Um, trying to, to get to direct. It's hard in England, in British TV in the back then. Um, and I was very frustrated. Um, and then I was, um, I'd started writing scripts with a friend. And um, so I was already working on scripts, my, um, but I was also working as a researcher on documentary. And I was uh, the, the main researcher on the Andy Warhol documentary that this show, the South Bank show, were doing. And I had already written a lot about Warhol when I was a music writer um, because I'd, my bit favorite band of all time was the Velvet Underground. I'd written the history of the Velvet Underground for the, for Melody, for the New, for NME, British music paper. And then I'd also done a big piece about Warhol for Melody Maker where it was about called Art Pop. It was about Warhol's influence on pop music both through the Velvet Underground and through his sensibility. So I'd gone and interviewed Warhol the process of doing all that, I had interviewed a lot of the, uh, most of the main people in the Warhol circle, and then we were doing the documentary, we went and interviewed them all again. So I knew a lot about Warhol. Um, but Valerie Solanas, the woman who shot him, was to me just this kind of, had always been presented to me as this footnote, this crazy woman who came and shot him. I knew she'd written a thing called the Scum Manifesto for this, her, her organization, which was the Society for Cutting Up Men, which just seemed sort of hilarious and weird. Anyway, I'm walking to work in Brixton, London, in London um, to, the to the subway, past the left-wing bookstore I always pass. I look in, and there in the window is a copy of the Scum Manifesto. I can't believe that someone published it. Like, oh my god, I've never read this. And I went and 
in and bought it. I started reading on the subway, and it, it literally changed my world. Because he has a great, very powerful writing voice. I'm a, a sucker for a good writer. It's like, everyone said this woman was just some crazy derelict, and she's a genius. A lot of what she says is crazy, but she's still really brilliant. And there's a logic to it. And then it made me think, well, who else is brilliant? You know, that, those per, that person you see standing on the, begging on the street corner, they, they might be a genius too. It, it completely reversed the hierarchy to me of, of what we think is, is valuable. Who do we think is valuable? And at this point, I was in, you know, this very good and prestigious award-winning documentary series that had been around for many years. It was a British institution, and we always did famous, great artists, whether they were in, in, in visual art or rock music or classical music or film. It was all like the great masters, and occasionally there'd be a woman, but, you know, mostly there were men. And Warhol was one of these great great men. And I thought, well, what if you do a documentary and you say that the most interesting person in this world isn't the famous artist, but the most obscure and despised uh, and neglected person in the story, the one that no one is interested in. But in this world where everyone was a superstar, Andy, Andy, I got to just talk to you for just a minute. It took more than talent to get attention. You want to kill all the men in the room? No. I don't think that would be necessary. You know, Andy, I, I really think you ought to produce it. You know? Have you finished it yet? It's way too disgusting. Even for us. So what does it have to take to get me on TV, huh? If anyone can make you a star, Andy can. I mean, you make you make something out of nothing, Andy. <laughs> Because nobody had written anything about Valerie or bothered to write anything about her. Zelig in the photo. The, yes. The, the unidentified over here, except in her case, of course, she's more notorious. Notorious, the, the, the notorious the, Valerie Slaughter. Yeah. And, and, and so to me, it was like, that was just, I just loved that reversal of, um, of hierarchies. So my original idea was, was uh, when I, the sort of blurry idea I had was, I, I'm really obsessed with this woman. I want to make a film about her. I felt it would be a documentary in the early stages, but I felt it would be kind of a radically different kind of documentary, and I knew it would have to have some kind of drama. I'd already done dramatic things in the documentaries. I was making little bits of drama, and very, they were all very, quite, you know, once I started, oh, that was, be, no, I had this idea before I'd actually directed anything. But anyway, years went by, very hard to get anybody interested in this. I knew I had to do a lot of research on it. And then I started directing, and I was doing these kind of stylized films. I worked a lot with, right, you know, a couple writers, um, and I would do like personal essays of theirs, but I worked with a writer called Paul Morley in, in Britain, and we did like a film about boredom, and we did a, a, a series, we did a film about hotels. I mean, they were just, they were just very stylized and fun to do. Um, so I was kind of learning how to, how to direct, I think. And I, still, I, never, I never lost sight of this goal that I had, that I would make a film about Valerie Solanas, and um, I managed to uh, there was a producer at the BBC who actually really li liked the idea, said I could have $150,000 of sort of money from the BBC and then go at it, see what you can do with that, see if you can get, raise some more money. And I, I went to New York and eventually someone introduced me to Christine Vachon uh, and Tom Kalin, who had a, and, and a New York independent film was, was really just getting going. So that was very, that was just very lucky. Um, and then I think it was, you know, Chris, I was already, it was already going to be drama documentary. Then it turns out there's no footage of Valerie. There's, you know, how do you going to do almost no footage, very little footage. And so they encouraged me, you know, because I was saying, ah, I think I, maybe I should be more drama. And they were like, yes, do it all as a drama. And so it was their endorsement of that that let me um, really leave. So it's so interesting that you had not really directed actors. You had not really directed, um, you hadn't really shot, um, mm. well, I, would, I wouldn't call I shot Andy Warhol in any way a traditional uh, film, and yet it is compared to a documentary mm. about boredom, for yeah. instance. Yeah. Um, the, the thing I noticed when I rewatched it um, a couple of weeks ago, uh, Pauline Kael used to say that there were like different categories of directors. There were directors who just shot the script. There were directors who were really producers with the word director on the back of their chair. And then she always used the term, and then the directors with filmmaking fever. Mm -hmm. And your 
you have filmmaking fever and mm -hmm. explodes in that movie. You can't, you kind of can't stop uh, inventing and you can't stop, and the pace of the movie is so certain. Um, it, the pace almost feels to me either in sync or perhaps even dictated by Lily Taylor's mm. certainty in her portrayal of Valerie. Um, mm. it, it, it feels to me like it's such a confident debut. And when, mm. you, when you watch it, a debut film later from uh, a director whose work you know, often you see the seeds maybe or sort of mm. the beginnings. I feel like you, you spring fully formed in that movie. Oh, thank you. I mean, I was pretty old. You know, it's funny because I had such a long such a long apprenticeship and I remember um, Anthony Wall who was the producer the BBC producer who gave me um, the seed money for our Andy Warhol saying to me when I was before I ever got to direct and I was very frustrated he said you know it's you're you're, you're gonna go through a lot of all this frustration but you will learn from everything you're doing he says and when that you get your chance you'll be ready and it was true I had spent so long frustrated and wanting to direct um, and doing these little things that were leading up to it. That when, that when it happened, I do think I was ready. The whole thing that I use in, in I Shot New World of the black and white, uh, um, which is black and white reversal, it, it, when Valerie, re, uh, Valerie reading out the manifesto, which is based on the Warhol screen tests, which were, which were shot in black and white reversal. And uh, I had that kind of, you know, I'd used black and white reversal and um, uh, black and white Super 8 in this film about boredom. And I, I'd done a lot of kind of fun things in my short films for the BBC. So I think kind of that all came together visually of different film stocks and stuff. And then, and then of course, I had a fantastic DP, Ellen Chorus. But it was when it came actually time to work with the actors, it's like, oh dear, how, do I, how am I going to work with the actors? It was the easiest thing for me of anything. That was the thing that is easiest for me, was working with actors. For whatever reason, for whatever I came through, it's just, and I realized that in the audition process, because you have to give the actors some guidance for when they do their, their second or, or third pass. I was, oh yeah, no, this, this, this come, and I remember the casting director said, oh, you're good with them. I'm like, oh, am I? Oh, that's great. And I mean, Lily Taylor said that when she came in, and, and she was sitting in with some of the actors to, uh, to read with them. And she was like, oh, then she realized then that I could direct. Mm. But yeah, that's, that's for me the most fun. It's the, the, the aspect I worry least about. Yeah, do you think it's because your father was an actor? I mean, I... So you, so you maybe understand the personality a little more than people who, who freeze up at that personality? Yeah, I mean, I've grown, you know, grown up around actors. I did a bit of acting myself in college. I'm, I'm definitely comfortable with them, and I, 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 I'm, I'm sympathetic to them. I feel like their, their life is so very hard. You know, being an actor is really difficult. Uh, so I think I come from a sympathetic place. But then I really think that dealing with actors is a matter of being clear. It's not mystic. There's a lot of what they need to know is very simple and direct. Mm -hmm. I, I like that. And yeah. then, and don't, but don't be scared of, of directing them. Like, if they're too slow, tell them. If they're overdoing it, tell them. They'll thank you later. Mm -hmm. You know, some people don't like to be directed, but you kind of have to grit your teeth and do it. Yeah, but what do you do then when, because, yeah, there are actors who, who take it as, uh, I, they show up with a performance almost fully directed by ah. themselves, and it, it, it can be painful. Do you just... Uh... It's really painful, and it's really hard. I, I, I've had that a little more in TV, I think. It's, it's hard to do that, because then it's really hard to change it. Mm -hmm. But I think I've been lucky. That's what, what the audition process is for me. Um, and then a little bit of early rehearsal. Like if someone's, for instance, adopted, sometimes people have developed a voice that they want to use, and it's just too much. So that's one reason why I do like rehearsal, because you have time to say no. Sorry, I mean, sounds great, but it's too much for this right. project. I'm always amazed by what actors do because it's really coming out of nowhere, and you're asking them on the count of three to bring incredible emotion out or incredible feelings, you know, like bang, you know, action. Um, it's and remember exactly where you're supposed to step, and remember exactly uh, mm -hmm. what you did last time. No, it, it's um, and I think that, I think that you know any young director who's a little afraid of actors really needs to just try doing some screen acting themselves, and you'll realize this is incredibly difficult, and they need help sometimes. It's not uh, absolutely, and I think they need help, but also I think they need, and this is where the long casting process helps. They need to know that you have real confidence in them. 
And I think if, if they're your choice, that's why I, I always try and, for a movie, fight for, fight for all my leads. Because if they know that you fought for them and you really believe in them, then that gives them a sort of, they can, they can relax a bit and, and you need to give them a safety net, you know, because they're on a high wire and they need to feel that you're there to catch them. They need to trust you that you will, you will, you will guide the performance if, it, if you feel it's going off course. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, they, they need to feel, and, and the, the sort of more confident and, and secure they feel, the easier it will be for everybody and, and the better their performance will be. What makes you think Andy Warhol, the greatest living artist of our time, wants to publish the ravings of a lunatic? On my way with David Testament. I shot Andy Warhol. Yeah, I had to, yeah, he had too much control over my life. What was the schedule and cost of I Shot Andy Warhol? It's funny, it was cost 1.75 million. So under two million, and we had 35 days, which um, I, I certainly could never get now. I would have fight for 25 or 30 now. Well, I'm stunned to hear that Charlie says it was 20 days. Oh, it was, yeah, that was difficult. That yeah, was that was that was well, that was that was under four million that film, or at least I think so. Um, and 20 days is tough, but I Shot Andy War had a lot of location moves and stuff. Um, yeah, I know, it was amazing, but I had a very, uh, you know, I had such a great DP. You're very dependent on my DP, you know, always uh, for its speed and movement. And she knew a lot, and she was very generous. Ellen Course was very generous and kind to me because um, I hadn't made a movie, and there was a ton of stuff I didn't. I still don't, I never went to film school, so there's a ton of stuff I don't know, technically, and I, I've got big gaps in my knowledge. I can never even remember what camera we're working with, you know. Somebody asked me, what camera are you using? I was like, oh, I think it's Sony, I don't know. <laughs> you know, I'm not, you know, technical in that way. At the same time, I always come in, when I was young, I, it was a choice between going to university or going to art school, and, and I think, I really love art, visual art, and I always do come in, I sort of, I come in with some kind of visual sense or plan or things, the way I want something to look. Um, and I just need to find a, a DP that I, I can have those kind of co that kind of conversation where they, we can agree on that. Mm -hmm. those, like what Charlie says, Krilla and I looked at some 60s movies and we looked at Badlands, which I think is 70s, it's just 70s actually. Um, and Badlands was our kind of uh, touchstone f for Charlie Says, particularly, uh, for such a, it's my favorite of his, uh, of Terrence Malick's movies. And the random and sort of offhand violence in it is so right, so perfect for, for that story and for Charlie Says. This pointless, like, and you know, it's uh, two sociopaths, you know. Uh, and there's also the look and the way it's shot. We, we really, we really, you know, and, and, and Krilla wanted the color timing to kind of evoke Badlands. Hmm, that's interesting. Yeah. Um, there's a shot in, in Charlie Says that I, I think is so, it, it's such a director's choice and it, it's, it's, it's chilling and yet I don't quite know why. Mm -hmm. um, it's when, when Charlie says that he wants his deerskin outfit and uh, I forget which of the girls says, uh, well, that we have to kill the deer. That's Leslie. That's Leslie, okay. Of course it is. Um, when Leslie says, we have to kill the deer, and they have this momentary face-off, instead of getting into their face-off, you cut to the back of the group, mm -hmm. and you very slowly just keep moving backwards. The, 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 the camera's moving away mm -hmm. from the confrontation, and yet it's a very chilling way to kind of isolate that uh, it, it's such a curious choice. I, I don't quite know why it's so effective. Uh, it's funny because we tried a little, a lot of different things, and that was one of the few days we had a crane. And usually I'm like, oh, I got a crane. You know, they take so long. You know, I mean, and DPs always love cranes, and I know sometimes they can be great, but it's like, oh, I take forever to put it, getting it ready. But in this case, it's like there was one crane shot, which is the one we used, where the timing was absolutely perfect, and that's why we used it because it's pulling out to catch this really, really awkward moment of silence after she said this thing and he's angry. And you pull it and you realize that everyone's, this whole crowd standing in front of their leader and then it rises up and then you cut back and close. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so it, 
it both it, the budget and the aesthetic sometimes go together in these things. You, it, it it made great sense, and you also had a crane for the day. You had a crane for the day, <laughs> which we usually didn't. Yeah. Uh, I just want to ask you one other thing about uh, I should Andy Warhol, and then we'll open the windows and mm -hmm. get some more air in here. Um, so, of, of course, her manifesto was published, but her play mm -hmm. Up Your Ass was not published until a couple of years ago. But it sounds like you guys got your hands on it. it sounds like you read it. It wasn't me, it was um, the researcher, a woman named Diane Tucker, who did a brilliant job of researching, and she tracked down the play. And the weird thing was, the play was in the collection of a guy who had a huge, big collection of pornography, and 50s pornography, and he was also one of the people we talked to for Betty Page. So it all, it all, uh, it all came together. I know, strange connections, but she tracked that down and we got a copy, which was fantastic. Did you ever read the entire play? I did, of course. How good a play is up your ass? It's, you know, it's very, it's, it's fun, it's very, I think probably a much better play than many things off, off Broadway in New York and, the, and probably um, has, uh, is less dated, yeah. They did a successful pro uh, production in San Francisco a few years ago. I mean, Valerie was a great, was such a talented writer, it's really sad that, that Madness, you know, consumed her in the mm. and schizophrenia. But she was super talented. Uh, do you remember when we met the first time? It had to do with the Independent Directors Committee. Yeah. Which is when Soderbergh had just, I think, just moved to New York and he put mm -hmm. together that group. Mm -hmm. And one of the first things we all talked about was, which we, we didn't do, of course, was starting a director's helpline. <laughs> Uh, and, and what everyone agreed was at some point during every shoot, you desperately need to talk to another director and explain how terrible you feel about something, how something's gone awry, how you, you just need an ear that only another director's going to understand. Uh, now, I, I still feel like we could use something like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, we even had a whole plan. Like, it would always be like a director on call, like a doctor <laughs> on call. Do you remember all this? I'm, I'm remembering it now <laughs> that you've mentioned it, yes. Do you, do you ever wish that there was a director's helpline? I, I do, I do. I mean, luckily my husband is also a director. That's true, you have a director's helpline. So he's my director's helpline. And he's, he's had many, many calls with me. Yeah. Um, so I, you know, because I have to say, nobody does it alone, and you can feel very isolated directing, depending on how supportive your producers are uh, and how supportive your team is, you know. But it really, and my husband's great because he looks at all my dailies. And gives me notes and he's actually he did go to film school so he's more technical than I am and he'll say things like why are you over why are you lighting so much and on Betty actually John my husband was the was the lens police because um, at the beginning before we started shooting uh, Mott Huffle and we had it we had an idea that we would only shoot with the lenses that were available in the 1950s and that was great and that was looking good and then on the second or third day of shooting John said you used a 65. Why did you use a 65? That's not available in the 1950s. So, oh, yeah, I guess that's true. And because uh, nothing over a 50 was available. And, um, and I asked him, I said, yeah, I know, but you know, we were stuck in this room and everything, and you know, it, it saved time. And, I, and, I thought, and then I talked talk to John about this, and he said, you know, you're either going to have this rule or you're not. And if, 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 it's, if it's difficult, then just move the, move the camera and stay with the 50, move it closer. And we did, and I have to say part of the, I'm really glad he told me that because part of the, the, the way, the reason that it's not just the film stock, the reason why um, that film looks so 1950s is the lenses. And we shot most of it, and I could shoot, I think me and, me and uh, Polanski are one of this, I think he shot uh, all of Rosemary's Baby on like the, mm. Is it the 27 or the 28? Now, I've, I've got confused because digital has different lenses, but it was basically the 27 is my fave. And uh, uh, I would shoot, I could shoot a movie on that, you know. Um, I'm not a big long lens person, although personal, they think they can look beautiful. Um, but I think because I'm so sort of steeped in certain films of the 50s and 60s, I, there's certain kind of lenses that come naturally to me. Mm. So Charlie's, uh, Charlie says, was digital like digital um, and actually Krilly used the red like the oh, the dragon or the monster a super super like 8k resolution red camera and usually I used to hate the red camera because it's too um, crisp but with this he said trust me what we want to do with the color we need all the we need all, all that resolution 
because we're going to play a lot with the color and po you know and 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 he also did something where he had a thing called a varicon he flashed the film with some purple light with a purple color hmm. to create it's all about getting the six, same color as 60s film um anyway uh I felt like, oh yes, actually it didn't look too crisp and the color I was very happy with actually, yeah. the look that it got. But with something like with that, we, we you know, in prep, we, we sat down, we had a sort of game plan, one of which is the ranch is very warm and vital and handheld, a lot of moving camera, very visceral, and the prison is cold and blue-gray, static, and he said, uh, you know, portrait lens, and he said, yes, he's Swedish, he said, like, persona, you know. Bergman, so it's yeah. all very Bergman in the in the prison, and um, and very moving and more, because the, the, the it, they're, uh, it's almost like in the prison there, it's the afterlife. It's like they're already dead. They're mm -hmm. in some purgatory, and they're mem they're remembering their past in the ranch. The 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 way movies are getting released now, independent mm -hmm. films are getting released, is it's it's so different. It's not necessarily worse. In some ways, it may be better than it was 25 years ago or so when I started or you started. Mm -hmm. um, I have a movie coming out this week. And oh. I can't tell you except for Cinema Village, mm -hmm. which is really the wrong theater for it anyway, but I can't tell you where else to see it because they just say it's on the platforms. Oh. And this is now considered, it's a good release that, that they got for the movie. Um, yeah. And I feel like, and I hate when people say this to me, oh, I, I couldn't find your movie. But I feel like Charlie says had a bigger scope out there for waiting waiting for it and yet you may be very happy with how it did. So how do you feel about how these movies get released now i always disappointed it didn't have more theatrical because i felt like it could have handled more theatrical but uh, on the hand you know i was glad it got in some theaters i was more disappointed I was very disappointed it didn't get theatrical in england it's to, which to me was amazing because it's matt smith is a big star there i don't know what happened there huh. I'm just very surprised there are certain places where it just didn't get theatrical. Um, and I think that's never happened, that's never happened to me before. But it is a new world. So, you know, I'm, I'm sad about that, particularly in England, because I spent a lot of my life in England, and it's like, really? And it's the, the two main stars are British. Yeah, that's peculiar, isn't it? Um, but, what, you know, out of my hands, really. Um, I, but I think I try and be stoic about it and just think, well, it's a, it, it can be a divisive film, this, I'm sure, like, um, but I'm hoping that people will gradually discover it. And enough people will say, have you seen this? Or, you know, it's going on Amazon Prime at the end of the month, and I guess more people will see it then. And, and maybe then they would have anyway in, in theaters. It, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's, you know, um, a poor way to reach people who, no. who, are, who would rather watch on their flat screen and control their sound bar. Anyway, so I, I, I try to be, in that sense, stoic about that. Maybe it's just a better way to look at this movie. I don't know. I mean, I still think you need theatrical because there, there's a profile that it gets from theatrical. Because um, a friend of mine wanted to write about Charlie Says for Sight and Sound for the British release, and then they said no because it doesn't get theatrical, so we won't, we won't cover it. So that was disappointing. Sure. But I had a very interesting experience with American Psycho. American Psycho um, did moderately well. When it was released, it, it had very mixed reviews. American Psycho it was rotten on Rotten Tomatoes for a couple of years. Uh, it was it had a couple great reviews and then a, a, some very mixed ones. Um, and it made I think fifteen million dollars at the box office for a film that cost like you know eight. It was okay, and then and then if, you know a few weeks after. Um, or months after, I got a call from Lionsgate, someone there, I said, I just want you to know, you know, it did really well in foreign, it made $25 million in foreign, so I thought, oh, that's nice. Anyway, I just had my second child, so I was not really focused on, on the movie at that point. But I thought, you know, I, I'm proud of this movie, I think it's an interesting movie, and then, you know, maybe uh, in 2005, I was doing um, an episode of Six Feet Under, and one of the women in it said to me, you know, I, I saw that movie, American Psycho, I think it's a really good movie. How come people don't talk about that movie? I was like, yeah, I, I feel like it was a good movie. I'm surprised too. The only thing that where I started to notice over the next couple of years was that if I did a TV show that there was always some young person on the set, an intern or a PA, who would, who would come up to me and say, I really like that movie. So I thought, oh, that's interesting, young people are seeing it. Anyway, 
fast forward a few years, and it's the only thing I've done, you know, it, it, it seems to be to get a crazy amount of attention. That's, that's the hit. That's the hit. It's my one hit, and I don't know why. It just was a hit in the end, but in a very long, slow motion yeah, way. Yeah. Can't explain it. Yeah, but I'm glad, you know, I'm relieved. It's, thank God, you know. Well, but you know what, though? I also think, like, you know, you have, you have, you're building a body of work, so, yeah. it, you know, beyond. But it is interesting, yeah, they do wind up having longer lives. It used to take 30 years for a movie to become that, that cult hit that it now can happen in a few years. And it, it's funny because... Speaking of kind of obscure things and, and, and despised categories, a lot of my favorite art, and music, books, films, are things that people didn't like at the time. You know, one of my very all-time favorite movies is Night of the Hunter, uh, the, the only movie Charles Lawton directed, which is a masterpiece. Night, uh, that was another movie I looked at for Betty Page. Uh, it's a masterpiece, I think. And it was a complete failure and sort of destroyed him. He He didn't make another movie, even though he's obviously a great director. So I, I love certain films like that, or I love those, those uh, I love Touch of Evil. I love, you know, things that are, are not valued, I think have a particular well, place Well, Sweet Smell of Success was considered yeah. a, a failure in its day. And yeah. Alexander McKendrick didn't make another movie, great director. So, yeah. so I feel like, and maybe, you know, maybe sometimes we, we make a film that isn't good and it, it really isn't, <laughs> you know, maybe people won't like it. But sometimes you make something and, and People won't, I always feel like, let's see in 20 years' time. Let's see in 30 years' time, if I'm still alive, you know, whether people are, are that to me, that's the test, is in 20 years, are people looking at it? Does it, or does it still hold up, you know? Is it dated? Does it feel, like, relevant? Well, there are a lot of movies that have won Best Picture that are not watchable anymore <laughs> yes. at all. So that's the, that's the truth. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, I think that... For directors, I tell myself this every day, you just have to keep going. It's not up to you whether your work will last or not. You know, you could only make what um, what is true to you. There's a great, Char Charlie Kaufman did a fantastic lecture for the BFI screenwriting series, a lecture, you know, a series of lectures given by screenwriters. I listen to it every so often, and, and he says this wonderfully, he says, all you have is you, you know? That's all you have is, is being true to you or what you're interested in. So it's like, well, whatever other people say and people think your ideas aren't interesting, all you have is you. And I think that if you're true to that, then something interesting will come out of it. And that's your job. You know, it's not your job to be a huge success. It's your job to try and make something interesting. If you enjoyed listening to Movies Till Dawn, I'd love to hear from you. You can email me at moviestilldawnpodcast at gmail.com. You can access these conversations at iTunes, Spotify, TuneIn, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, SoundCloud, YouTube, as well as our website, moviestilldawnpodcast.com. If you'd like to see some videos pertaining to the guests of each episode, please visit my blog at moviestilldawn.blogspot.com. And please feel free to follow me on Twitter at RealRDEF. That's R-E-E-L-R-D-E-F. All interview material and audio clips are covered by the Fair Use Copyright Act of 1976, in which allowance is made for fair use for purposes such as criticism, comment, news reporting, teaching, scholarship, education, and research. Mm -hmm.